Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today on leadership and management. Um, it's called Doing the Right Things and Doing Things Right, How Do We Manage? And I'm so pleased to welcome Andy Hockley, our presenter today, who's joining us all the way from Transylvania and who has very kindly offered to be up at 4 a.m. to present the session for us. Welcome, Andy. Hi, Apana. Hi, everybody. Um, now, before we move any further, I'd just like to make sure that you can hear me and you can see my screen. Um, please type in yes in the chat dialog box if you can see my screen and hear me okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks everyone. So as I was saying, we're so lucky to have Andy Hockley here today. And most of you here know Andy and have been trained by him. For the rest, Andy Hockley is a lead trainer on the International Diploma in Language Teaching Management, or IDLTM as we call it, and the author of From Teacher to Manager, which is the core textbook on the IDLTM. Um, when he's not teaching, Andy also works as a freelance educational management consultant. Um, once again, Andy, thank you so much for being here to do the session for us and over to you. <coughs> Thanks, Afana. And uh, you've rather, rather oversold that. It's only 5 a.m. It's not 4 a.m. Oh, sorry. But, um, but, <laughs> but it still feels quite early in the morning. Uh, and it's also about minus 20 outside. So um, it's a uh, Luckily, it's warm enough here. So anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I realise there it's it's two o'clock in the afternoon or or different times if you're in different parts of Australia. Um, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's good to 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 be here. I can't see who's here, um, so I don't know what names are. So I'm 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 assuming there are some people as as a partner alluded to that I know. Um, and to those of you, hello. And to those of you I don't know, hello as well. So, this is a, a really a, a, a talk about um, leadership. Uh, we're going to contrast leadership with management, and um, we're going to talk about what what it what it means to be a leader and how you can be um, a, a more successful leader. And I'm waiting for the screen to change. I'm still getting used to the lag on this software. Um, it seems a bit too long. So I'm not sure about this. OK, we've got there to the agenda. So that we'll, we'll talk a little bit, first of all, about what leadership is. Uh, I'll contrast that and, and talk about the links between leadership and management. Uh, I'll talk also about some ideas about leadership that you um, that, that are out there, some some models and some theories about leadership, and then we'll get on to application how how this how this applies to you, how you can maybe use this in your work, and how you can how you can be a, a better leader um, of your team, of of your department, of your people, depending on what, what what group of people you're 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 managing and leading, if you like, and I'll share. Uh, a model of five parts for for doing that, and then at the end we'll, I'll, t I'll take questions. Um, I'll probably just leave the questions until the end if that's okay. Um, but if 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 people seem to need to ask questions, Aparna, uh, let me know through the through. I can see you chatting. Um, I can't see anybody else chatting. So if there are, if there is anybody wanting to 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 jump in, um, then then. Please let me know, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll I'll pause, and we can we can find a space to to ask that question. But otherwise, if you hold your questions until the end, uh, that would be great. <coughs> and um, Aparna has these slides, and I'm very happy for you to have access to them afterwards. I guess the webinar will be online afterwards. I'm not sure, Aparna, um, but. Um, 
if 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 it is, then obviously you can rewatch the webinar. And it, but if you also want the slides, um, uh, I don't know if a partner can make them available somehow through the EA website. But you're welcome to have the keep have the slides. So if you want just kind of keep an eye on things, that's fine. I'm still getting used to the lag on this. <laughs> it seems very slow. I apologize for this, everyone. There's another slide coming. Here we go. OK, so what I'd like you to do now, uh, first of all, is something for you to just, to, just to think about. Um, and think of someone who you think is uh, um, an excellent leader or an inspiring leader. And what is it about them that makes them a good leader? So for a few minutes, just on your own, think think of uh, someone you've met, someone you've worked for, someone you work with, someone you know, or somebody famous that you've never met that, that you, you regard as a, as, a, as a great leader in some way. And for a couple of minutes, think about that person and the qualities they have and make a note of those qualities. What is it that makes that person such a good leader? And um, I'm going to give you two minutes for this. Um, it's going to be silent for two minutes, unless you hear my me drinking water. Um, but uh, so just just take two minutes to to think about that and note down those qualities, and then we'll we'll come back to this to this subject. Uh, sorry for my typing because I was trying to actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm working with Abana to try and make the slides move better. Um, hopefully, we fix that now. Um, 
anyway, I, I hope you've had a chance to sit and think about what it is that a leader might offer, what a leader might be. And here are some possible ideas. These are some of the things that you might have written down. These are some of the things that other groups in the past have written down in answer to this question. Um, things like a, le a leader needs to be a listener, needs to be honest, needs to be someone you can trust, and also seems to, uh, no, needs to be someone who will put their trust in you. Uh, charismatic, we often see leaders as charismatic. Visionary has this kind of clear idea of the future. Someone who's decisive and makes 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 strong and good decisions and quick decisions sometimes. Someone who communicates well. Someone who walks the talk. Some, someone who does what they ask others to do. Someone who's inspiring, a mentor, strong, involves people, and someone who's open. So these are some of the qualities that you might have written down. You might have written down, might have noted down other qualities um, while while you were thinking about uh, what a leader does and what a leader, um, what qualities a leader has. So it's just a kind of a, a, a by way of an introduction about sort of you know the idea of the leader. So. What's the difference between management and leadership? I'm going to go through this quite fast because a number of you would have seen this before, but um, uh, it's an interesting difference that we that we perceive between management and leadership, and I think it's quite um, revealing uh, actually about the way that uh, we've become very very interested in leadership and less interested in management. I think that's problematic, but um, but I do think the two things are very interlinked. <coughs> so a couple of quotes for you. This is something, a quote from Stephen Covey, who says, who uses the quote, "Management works in the system, and leadership works on the system." The idea being that management, you know, a manager has limits and boundaries within which he or she can work, and and though within those boundaries, that's how they work. Whereas a leader uh, is looking at the system and thinking, well, how can I change the system to make things work more successfully? Um, another quote um, by Peter Drucker um, is, which it kind of forms the um, the title of this presentation. Actually, management is doing things right, and leadership is doing the right things. Uh, again, you know, management is making sure things are done well. And leadership is actually working out what things need to be done, which is a slightly different way of looking at things. Uh, Covey also has a, an analogy of what a manager, the difference between management and leadership is where you're hacking, your team of people are hacking your way through the jungle. And the manager is there with the team, uh, supporting people, making sure that um, people rotate to the front so that everybody's doing the right amount of work. And nobody's nobody's doing too much. Nobody's doing too little. The, the machetes are kept sharpened, etc., etc., etc. Whereas the leader is the person who taught, uh, climbs to the top of the tallest tree, looks out over the jungle, and says, "Ah, oh, no, we're going the wrong way." Actually, in the original analogy, it's no, we're in the wrong jungle. In fact, but so there's there's the idea of the kind of the difference between a manager and a leader. <laughs> And you may have seen uh, a list like this, which is all a bit kind of soundbitey about what's the difference between a manager and a leader. Um, but this is this is the way that um, this this is presented quite often. The manager administers, where the leader innovates, comes up with new things. The manager is a copy, if you like. There's a, a job description for a manager, whereas a leader, it's it's not something you can necessarily write down in a job description. Uh, the manager maintains systems, whereas the leader develops new things. The manager focuses on the systems and on the structure, makes sure everything is working, and the leader focuses on people. The manager relies on control, and the leader inspires trust. <coughs> I'm not quite sure where that's all gone to the bottom. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, oh, no, I've gone forward. I'm not sure how that happened. Okay. Um, so the manager is looking to this this term, this semester, this week, this this you know five week session. If you have five week sessions, the leader is looking two years down the line, three years down the line. Uh, the manager asks 
how are we going to do something and when are we going to do it? And the leader asks, what are we going to do and why? So it's more, again, more sort of outward looking. The manager has their eye on the bottom line, the budget, the money, and the leader has their eye on the horizon. The manager accepts the status quo and the leader challenges it. The manager is the classic good soldier, if you like, follows orders and makes sure that everything is running smoothly. And the leader is their own person and the manager does things right and the leader does the right thing. Now, as I say, it's a bit soundbitey, this, 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 this list, but it, it does kind of give an example of how people are perceiving the difference between management and leadership or have been perceiving the difference between management and leadership. And this um, has caused a few problems, I think. Um, and uh, a number of articles since the um, financial crisis of 2008 have, um, have posited that one of the, the reasons why the crisis happened was that was because um, leadership was seen as this very sexy subject. And MBA programs, um, manage, essentially programs that are supposed to be training the new generation of managers, were very focused on leadership. Leadership was the subject everybody wanted to teach and everyone wanted to be a leader and all these things. So we had all of these people looking at the horizon, all these people changing things, all these people taking big risks, and nobody actually maintaining things, nobody making sure things were working. So, um, so in the financial services industry, there were um, there were people, there were just people taking risks, basically, um, because of the surfeit of leadership training and not enough management training. So, both of these things are incredibly valuable. Management is vitally important, and leadership is important too. They're both important, but and I think they're much more interlinked than this kind of um, this this slightly glib um, description of the difference uh, makes makes seem. Another um, idea about leadership uh, is to do we, we have these we have these myths about leadership. Uh, one myth is that leadership is a rare skill that very few people are leaders. Um, well, in fact, actually, many people can have leadership skills, and that, and that's and can and do have leadership skills. And in your own organisations, you have a lot of leaders. A lot of your teachers are leaders, and in the classroom, nearly all of them are. I hope. Um, and leaders are born and not made. Well, no, leadership still you can you can develop leadership skills. And, as, and, as, and a, a bit later in the in the presentation, I'm going to give you some some ideas. I hope that will help you to develop some some leadership skills. <coughs> a couple more of these old and new beliefs. I'm still waiting for it to at least kind of half appear. On there we go. Uh, leaders are charismatic, and, and obviously many, you know, many particularly famous leaders tend to be charismatic. You know, you, you, you know Nelson Mandela's are charismatic leaders, uh, but some leaders are not necessarily charismatic. They're quiet. They get on with the job, and they're very, but they're very effective. And you can be a quiet and effective leader. Uh, leadership only exists at the top. That's a traditional idea about leadership. Well, no, leadership exists all throughout the organization. Many, you know, as I said before, many people in the organization are leaders. And the old idea, the kind of Machiavellian idea of the leader, the controlling, directing, and manipulative leader. Now, the leader encourages people, listens to people, and develops people. So those are some ideas, some of some, some kind of new things about leadership that, that, we, that we perceive now. <coughs> Now, Daniel Goleman, who you may be may know as the um, author of the book about emotional intelligence, uh, he was the person who co coined that phrase, emotional intelligence. Uh, also, um, wrote a book about leadership and um, how leaders act with people. And um, he he uh, came up with five initially five, then it became six. Um, leadership styles that he identified that people, that the good leaders uh, were able to use. And the idea here is that there are these five leadership styles, no, there's six, sorry, no, six leadership styles that you, um, as a leader, if you're, a, to be a successful leader, you need to be able to use these styles, you need to be able to use all of them at the right time. So, <laughs> to give, to, to explain what these styles are, so the directive style 
is the decisive, strong style, let's say. It's the one who says, do this now, and people do it because you said them, you told them to do it. Um, uh, he is quick to point out that the directive style is not actually useful most of the time. It's not a good leadership style to be using most of the time, but there are situations where being directive is it is an important leadership style and you should be directive at certain times and these times tend to be times of a crisis or an emergency when there's a, when there's some kind of crisis you the leader needs to be able to say do this now um, the example of course is if there's a fire you don't want someone who's going to say well let's form a committee and talk about these things and, and work out what's the best thing to do you, know, you want someone who's going to say okay everyone out the, st out the door down the stairs and so on the authoritative style is the leader with a vision, uh, the, the, the idea that someone has this clear vision and, and people are drawn toward that vision because, but because of the inspirational qualities of the leader or because of the inspirational qualities of the vision. To say, you know, this is really where we want to go and it's inspiring, therefore we'll, we'll follow. So that's the authoritative, authoritative style. <coughs> the affiliative style is the is about bringing people together, is about linking people and connecting people and building a team and making um, making people feel part of a team. Um, uh, it's you know particularly useful, let's say, after there's been a conflict when you know when people are feeling sort of slightly disassociated from each other. So the affiliative style is 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 the leader who can bring people together. Democratic style is the style about um, making sure you get everybody's input into decisions or the, the people whose input need to be there, the, the people involved in that decision, let's say. Um, making sure you consult people, making sure you, you, you talk to different people so, so that it's not just about you, it's about making sure people feel involved in the, in the, in the important decisions and making sure those decisions are made in a democratic way. The pace setting uh, style is the other one that uh, that, uh, that um, Goldman kind of counsels is not that useful most of the time. The other the other four, the authoritative, affiliative, democratic, and coaching, are the ones that he he says are the strongestly the most important ones. <coughs> Whereas the pace setting um, style is like the directive a little bit, yeah, use it sparingly. So the pace setting style is the the leader who basically works very, very hard and people work very hard because the leader works very hard and, and they kind of see and they and they want to they want to work with and at the same pace as the leader. Uh, this is is in a very very highly motivated team in certain situations that can work. Uh, other times it is a recipe for burnout for for everybody, not just the leader but everybody will end up burning out and it will be it can be a can be a big problem. And um, finally, the coaching style is the one in which the leader basically helps the staff to 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 learn the, how to do things. So, if the, you know, if the staff have a problem, the leader helps them to work out the best way to solve that problem, the best way to to make that uh, no longer be a problem. So this is the summing up Goldman's idea that leaders are able to do all of those things at the right time. So give clear direction, that's the directive style, create a shared vision, build bridges within and between groups, make de democratic decisions, set high standards, that's the pace setting, and encourage and develop others. So that's the kind of the summary of, of, of what Goldman says a leader should be able to do. Sorry, there's been a small pause. I'm not quite sure why it's not moved on. Now I can see a palm's cursor too. I think I, I think we missed a slide. But anyway, uh, so, so a couple of quotes. Um, it's this is a quote from Mandela, who I've already mentioned. I think um, this is a. I think this is a nice example of. So the leader is not someone who takes all the the glory. <laughs> When things go right, the people who made it happen are the team who made it happen. So you celebrate victory by leading from behind, if you if you like. 
uh, and your job is to take the front line when there is danger, then people will appreciate your leadership. And another quote, um, should be here in a minute, uh, this is from The Art of War by Lao Tzu, so it's a pretty old quote. Um, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. A good leader who talks little when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, people will say, we did this ourselves. And so that's the idea of a leader is, is someone who is inspiring, bringing people along, but actually they feel empowered. And they feel they succeeded in doing these things. <coughs> Excuse my coughing. Okay, so what? So this is, we're getting onto the, the meaty part of the presentation now, if you like. How can we make leadership less vague and more accessible? Um, how can we become better leaders while still managing successfully? Because right now, you know, I presented these ideas about leadership, and when you read the ideas about leadership, it's all a bit vague. I mean, this leadership, it's, it's, it's all about being, an, uh, being this kind of person or that kind of person. And, um, and you know, we can identify different different leaders and we can think about well what their commonalities and so on but in fact it's very difficult to say okay well how do you become a leader so uh, we're now moving on to the idea of you know how how do we be a leader how, how do you learn to be a leader I've said that you can learn to be a leader it's not something that you can that is that is closed to everybody leaders are not born you are leaders can be made so <coughs> So this is um, um this the rest of this presentation and is based on the work of a guy called James Schooler plus things that I've added in and I've kind of created a, a this five part model which will which hopefully will give some ideas of how you can be a better leader. So Schooler defines leadership as a series of choices and actions around making the goal happen, if you like, and it and he's trying to focus very much on what leaders do. Um, rather than how they should be, because as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the time we, we leadership is presented as a trait-based thing. It's people who are honest and open and good listeners and decisive, and all. They're, they're traits. They're not necessarily things that people do. So <coughs> the idea here is to look a bit more at what they do rather than how they should be. Um, and in the in the sense, he kind of developed his work from the work of uh, John Adair, who created this model of action-centered leadership where um, leadership is about achieving the task, managing the team and managing individuals. And you'll see that in this model, leadership has a lot of management in it because two of these three parts are, are you know, have the word managing in them. They're, you know, management and leadership are intertwined and they're not separate. So I think it's, it's, I think it's always important to not separate these these these, these things. <coughs> so this is Stuhler's model. Um, it's uh, he has these four aspects of it, um, which are quite similar to Adair's, but there's a, there's obviously there's a fourth one. So there's motivating purpose, there's task, progress, and results. So the motivating purpose is setting a purpose and a direction which inspires people, it gives people a reason to do things. The task progress and results part is paying attention to how successfully and how well and how in, with what quality people are doing the work. Uh, making sure the group is, is united and working well together and making sure that the individuals within the group feel uh, supported and feel helped and so on. So that's what, that's how Schooler um, perceives leadership uh, with these four dimensions. So <clears throat> this is my, um, if you if you like, I've tried to take Schooler's idea and turn it into something that's practical and uh, useful for you to think about how you can maybe sort of add to your leadership abilities. And um, I've sort of divided into five components. Four of them are, are basically linked to Schooler's model, and one of them is, the, in some ways, to me, the most important one, which is make time. I'm going to go through all these components in a second. So we're going to talk about making time, developing a shared vision. How do you do that? Making sure that you get to know your team. And when I'm using the word team here, I, I, what I mean is the people who are 
who are you are responsible for, if you like. So it, if you're a director of studies, it might be all the teachers in your group. It might be some of you I know have like a night director of studies and a day director of studies. It might be so it would be the day teachers if you're the day director of studies and so on. So or if you're a senior teacher, who's in your team and so on. So I mean, I hope that the word team is is okay. I'm I'm using the word team now, and I'm uh, that's who I mean. The people you're you're working with, if you like. Uh, how to support their work, the team's work, and making sure that the team is harmonious, keeping an eye on the harmony of that. <coughs> so we're going to start off with making time. And I think you I think this will not be a big surprise to you, or, <laughs> or will not be unusual, or not be unfamiliar to you, that much of your time is spent firefighting, as we often say, that basically it's responding to problems, responding to crises, opening your emails and doing something about it, um, dealing with issues as they arise and resolving conflicts. It's a very reactive, it's, it quite, can be quite a reactive job and uh, I'm very aware of that. Um, and obviously we would like to be more proactive, we would like to do things more proactively, but it's, very, it's one, one thing to say, okay, I want to be more proactive, we want another thing to do it. So in order to be able to be more proactive and have that chance, we, we've got to make time. You know, if, we, if we're spending eight hours a day reacting to problems, we don't have time to sit down and say, okay, how can I, how can I, how can we move forward? How can I work on the system in um, in uh, in Covey's ter terms? <coughs> so I'm sure you've heard this this um, this story. Some of you will have heard this story about the big rocks, and I'm going to go through it quite quickly because I don't want to spend too long on it. But the the so, the, the, the story is of a professor who comes into the, 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 the lecture and with this big bucket and in, in this bucket he puts a bunch of big rocks until the bucket is full and he asks the audience, is the bucket full? And the, the audience says, yes, it is. And then he takes out some pebbles and he puts the pebbles in the bucket and you know obviously the pebbles go between in the gaps between all the rocks and he says, is the bucket full? And now the audience is a bit wiser and, he's, and they say, um, or pop, we think so, but maybe not. And then he brings out some sand and he pours the sand in and of course the sand goes in the gaps between the little pebbles and the rocks. And um, and then he says, is the bucket full? And again they say, yeah, yeah well, we think so. And then he brings out um, some beer and he pours the beer in into the bucket and of course the beer goes in amongst the sand and wets the sand, but you, you can get more in the bucket. The point of this story is not that <coughs> you can always get more in. Um, the point, the, the, the story actually has two points. The, the first point is that not that you can you can always get more stuff in your day. The point is that you need to do the big rocks first, because if you don't do the big rocks first, you don't actually get any. You, you know, you don't. You're never going to get the big rocks in. If you start with the sand, the big rocks have got nowhere to go. So it's, it, the important thing is to prioritize and work out. Okay, what are the big rocks today? What are the what are the things that I really need to focus on? Uh, and you know, leave the sand and those little things, the little niggly things, for, for later. And the other point of the story is there's always room for beer. <laughs> so think about quadrant two. Now, quadrant two, some of you might be familiar with the idea of quadrant two, and some of you might not be familiar with the idea of quadrant two. So I'll show you what quadrant two means. What is quadrant two? This is um, a, another model that came from Stephen Covey originally, the urgent and important matrix, where we have things which are both urgent and important in quadrant one. Um, those are crises and emergencies and things that you have to deal with. You, you have no choice there. You have to do them now and they're, they're important and they're urgent. In quadrant three, you have things which are urgent but not important. And we'll get back to quadrant three. Quadrant two is the things which are important but not urgent. And finally, quadrant four is the things which is just the time wasting things, which sometimes is referred to as the Facebook quadrant. Quadrant four, things that are not urgent and not important. <coughs> and um, so things in quadrant one, we have to do. Whatever crisis comes up, you have to take care of it. You can't ignore it because you'd rather be doing something that you that you something else. You've got to do it now because it's urgent and it's important. Things that are in quadrant two, these are the things that we should do, but we don't. Um, to, 
uh, I mean, to give you an example from, from, from people's, uh, not from work life, but personal life, exercise is a quadrant to activity. We all know that exercise is good for us, that exercise will be useful, that it will be good for us to exercise. Some of us are very good about that and manage to exercise, and some of us are less good about it and don't manage to exercise. And it's one of those things that gets put off. It's like, well, I know it's important, but it's not urgent. I don't have to do it now. I can do it later. So you, you put it off and you put it off and you put it off and you put it off until the point comes when you didn't do it. <laughs> and that's that's the problem that we have. The, the things that are in quadrant two, which are really, really important things, but that they can be done any time, in the end, don't get done. And the reason they don't get done is because we spend too much time in quadrant one and quadrant three, and sometimes quadrant four as well. So in quadrant one, we don't really have a choice about quadrant one. We have to do the stuff in quadrant one. But quadrant three, we have these things which are they're urgent, but they're not important. So someone someone sends us an email, and they want a reply right now, but it's actually not an important email. And, we, and the reply can wait. Or you get a phone call, or you, or someone comes and knocks on your door and comes in. And and um, these of these kind of interruptions to our day are the reason that we don't actually spend time in quadrant two. <coughs> so some of the things which are quadrant two activities are things to do with improving communication, preparing things better, making sure things are better organized, better planning, taking better care of yourself, looking for new opportunities and taking them, and personal development, developing yourself. These are all quadrant two activities. But we, all, we know they're important, but often we don't get to do them because we don't really give ourselves time. Um, this is a quadrant, the task for you to think about after the webinar. It's not something you want me to do today. But think about you know, what, are your, what are your quadrant two activities? How much time do you spend doing those things? And how can you spend more time there? So there's some, some questions to think about after we finish today. So here are some tips on, on, um, on getting more time in quadrant two. Uh, try and take care of urgent things before they become urgent. So make a note of all the quadrant one and three activities that you often do, all the urgent stuff that you have to do all the time. And write down how, make a business, think about how you can prevent these things from recurring, uh, or from becoming emergencies in the first place. So in fact, if you plan better, if you organize things better, a lot of these urgent things never become urgent because they're, they're within the system. Um, that means, I mean, there, there will always be quadrant one activities. Someone call, a teacher calls you at eight o'clock in the morning and says they're sick and they can't come to work and you've got to organize a cover teacher. I, you know, clearly that's a quadrant one activity has to be done. But if you're always reacting to that uh, by kind of panicking and thinking, oh God, who am I going to find and trying to call, trying to work out who's available, who might be available. Um, it's spending a lot of your time doing that. But if you spend time in quadrant two to kind of plan a system about that, where you always know who the, te who the first teacher to call at any particular time of the day when one teacher is sick, that you, you, you've, you've got a system and it doesn't take much of your time and it's not a panic and, it's, and it, it, it's still quadrant one, it's still urgent and important, but it takes much less time, giving you much more time in quadrant two. So make some time for quadrant two activities. Uh, look at all the things in quadrant four and stop doing them. Um, now, I've called quadrant four, I sort of jokingly call it the Facebook quadrant. You have to decide what's important to you. And, um, and you know, I've, Facebook might be a time waster, might be a quadrant four activity. And I'm just using Facebook as an example here. Obviously, there's many other quadrant four activities. Um, but, you know, I mean, actually, there can be quadrant two activities in Facebook. People use Facebook for developing their PLN, their personal learning network, and, and, make, you know, and keeping up to date and, 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 and having new inputs into their, into their work, or keeping up with old friends, which, again, is, is not a quadrant, it's not a time waste, it's an important thing to do. So, you know, it's just make sure that you use it wisely, I would say, rather than not ever using it. 
Now, the other, the other, stopping doing things in quadrant four is quite is, is easy because you know it's the time waster and you can you can you can find a way of stopping doing that. Looking at the things in quadrant three and stop doing them too is more difficult because it involves saying no. So when someone comes to you and says, "Can you do this?" you say, you you have to say, "No, not now. I'll uh, you know come back to me later or I, I'll find some time later." So quadrant, stopping doing things in quadrant three is a bit more tricky because it involves saying no. And it involves maybe not opening your emails when you're in the middle of uh, a task. You're in the middle of some kind of task which is important, and suddenly a little thing comes up on your screen saying you've got a new email. And rather than look at it later, you look at it now. And then, of course, you're distracted and you might follow the email and you spend a lot of time doing that. This all gives you more time to spend on quadrant two. Now, I'm talking about time management here, but I feel like I'm not managing my time. I need to move on a bit faster. Uh, make time to do your quadrant two activities. Put them in a calendar just like a meeting. Here is the time I'm going to spend uh, thinking about next year. Um, what do we need to do for next year so that we, we can plan things more, for example. Um, uh, what, what needs to happen for, for, for next term and so on. You know, so it's, it's these, kind of, these, these times where you need to plan or you need to be organized. So you're doing quadrant two things. Um, this is, these are the leadership things, if you like. So put them in your calendar just as if they were a meeting, and then do them like you scheduled them. Don't do something else when you scheduled them. So, so you know, rather than say, well, I'll probably do it on, on Thursday. If you say, I'll probably do it on Thursday, you won't do it on Thursday. You'll do it, you, might, you won't not do it on Thursday, you won't do it on Friday. You might, it will hang over till next week, and then it might hang over to the week after. Put it in your calendar, do it. And the more time you spend in quadrant two, actually you spend less time in quadrant one. As I've said, quadrant one you can't you can't avoid quadrant one because you've got to do them. But um, you spend more time in quadrant two. You organise more things. You get more things working more successfully, and you end up spending less time in quadrant one. Uh, and as you reduce quadrant one, you spend more time in quadrant two. So that was your make time component. That was the, that was this one. Um, now we've got uh, the other four, and uh, these are, if, as a, these are the ones based on Schooler, if you like. But they're, I've, I've sort of come up with some some suggestions of how you can do these things. Now, the idea of shared vision. Now, many of you will be sitting there thinking, "Oh no, vision! It sounds so, it sounds so corporate. It sounds so, it sounds so marketing." And my teachers will hate the idea of vision. I don't want to do. I can't. I'm not doing vision. But what I mean by vision here is, is something that your team generates, which talks about what kind of workplace you want to have, uh, what, what, what the purpose of the work is, and so on. So it's some, so it's some statement that you as a team generate about, about the work that you do and how you want to do it better. And I suggest you bring your team together and you talk about those things. You ask them questions. Why do you come to work? Why do you want to be a teacher? Uh, why, do you work for, why do you work for us? Um, <coughs> Here's an example of a of a of a of a shared vision, let's call it. So this is something that a group of teachers came together and worked on and 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 decided this is what they they um, they perceived as their goal for the school. The language school dedicated to learning, student learning obviously, and we as a team we are working to develop our students' learning. In order to do that, we're a supportive team. We support each other. Uh, we work well together. We help each other. And we're, we're trying to keep up to date with the new ideas. We're, we're at the cutting edge of new ideas in our profession. And we want this to be the best place to work in this city. And I think this is a, it's, it's a, it's a nice, it's, it's a bit longer than I would sort of necessarily counsel people to do, but it was a, I think it's a good one because it makes it clear how you know what it is we're we're striving for? We want to be the best place in the city. <coughs> Keep the vision in mind, and because it's motivating, it's motivating to kind of remind yourself of this. And actually, having that discussion and generating a statement like that is is a very motivating thing to do. And people do get involved in it, and it becomes a bit less. Oh no, we're going to talk about the vision, but it, it, it is it is good. So. Keep it in mind. Make sure that people, other people, keep it in mind, and remind yourselves from time to time what is the vision, why are we here, what are we doing, and revisit it from time to time. Uh, because you need to maybe go back to it and say, okay, 
do we want to change the vision? Maybe we have another meeting where we where we discuss what what we'd said and see if we want to change it. And I would suggest, let's say, every two or three years, go back to the vision and try and 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 see if you want to rewrite it. Um, I mean, partly the reason is that the, your your need for the vision changes. Maybe you've already made your workplace the best place to work in the city, and now your your vision is about maintaining it or making it even better somehow. Uh, and also, of course, you get new staff who weren't involved in that process to, uh, in the first place, and they need to be kind of drawn into the process. So, in a sense, that kind of that helps you to um, uh, to build a to build a shared vision, uh, and that's the motivating purpose of Schooler's model. Now, getting to know the people in your team, in a sense, this overlaps very strongly with the vision thing because these are questions. Some of these questions are, are related to the vision. Okay, but what do your what do your team need? What do the individuals need from their work, from 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 you, from the school, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? What do they want? Why do they? Why have they chosen to teach English? What 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 was their motivation for teaching English? And why do they do it at your school? Now, why do they teach English? It's probably not about the money. So why do they do it? And why do they teach English at your school? <coughs> is it just because you offer them hours, or is it is there some reason why they want to teach English at your school? How? What what makes your school appealing to people? What are their plans? What, what do they want in the future? And these kind of questions that I mean, they, 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 you might know this about some of your teachers, but probably don't know this about all of your teachers. What you know? Who are they? What, what, you know. So getting to know the people in your team is, is is actually very very useful in terms of being a leader. So understand them as individuals, assist them and support them as individuals, help them as individuals if you like, and um, make sure that you've agreed with them the things that they should be doing, what their responsibilities are, what their objectives are, and you know, make sure that you know you're working with them to ensure that those objectives are are, are achieved. Make sure you give recognition to the individuals. Um, if appropriate, give them more more responsibilities, advancement, etc. etc. Offer them training if you have the opportunity to do that. I know some of these things are budget related, but <coughs> work out ways that you can help to train and develop um, them, and give them the opportunity to have more freedom. And this is the co this is a coaching model of um, of of, um, of Goldman. It's the idea that you know you you can help your <laughs> staff to grow and learn things and 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 develop their freedom, and they can do this on their own. They don't need you don't need to tell them what to do all the time. So we've, we've talked now about making time, developing a shared vision, and getting to know your team. We've got two more to go through, and I'm slightly overrunning, I think, but we'll, we'll, we should be okay. So supporting their work is to do with the task, the progress towards the task. Pay attention to the quality of progress. If things aren't being done well or effectively on a reasonable time, Find out why. Is it just because people are being lazy, or is there some other reason? What's what other reason is there? As a leader, it's okay to manage. It's okay to tell people what to do. It's okay to say to people, okay, you need to do this, and you need to do it now because you, it's your responsibility. Check in with people. Make sure that there are stand, people know what standards things are supposed to be done to. Monitor people. Offer support. And MBWA, you might be familiar with this term, and you might not, is management by walking around. <laughs> it sounds odd, but actually, there's a whole theory of management by walking around. It's actually, you know, rather than sitting in your office, you you need to be around. You need to be there. You need to be outside the and outside on kind of walking around and sort of like you know talking to teachers in the corridor outside classrooms or you know like in the staff room or wherever they happen to be. Just you know, just you know, make yourself available, make yourself present, and you'll learn a lot more about what's going on than by sitting uh, in your office all the time. I won't read through all of these because I don't I don't want to um, uh, spend too much time. But these are some of the some of the things that you need to be doing when you're focusing on the task. And the last one, the final one of the five, is keeping an eye on the harmony of the group. Um, 
making sure that the group is working uh, successfully together. Um, in your context, that this might be less important, this might be the least important of the five components because you may have a team which is quite disparate and they don't necessarily meet each other a lot of the time because they're coming in to do a few classes here and there and then going away and so on. So this one might be slightly less important for, for many of you, but it is worth having a cohesive and useful and, and kind of well well oiled team, if you like. <coughs> uh, so make sure that people are working together, you're anticipating conflicts, you're resolving those conflicts, um, there's a cooperative spirit, there's morale and so on. Um, again, give the, give the group more freedom and authority just as you do with the with individuals. If the group has training needs, see if you can meet those needs some way and make sure that you're, you're working with the group, giving feedback to the group and, um, and getting feedback from them on how things are going. So that's, that's the kind of the final part of that. So this is going back to um, Schooler's model. So that was the, so that we've talked about the motivating purpose, the task, progress and results, the upholding group unity and the attention to individuals. And Schooler also talks about in order to be a better leader, you need to bear in mind that your leadership is, takes place on three levels. One level is the public, meaning the, the things that everybody sees. So when you're with the team, the, your, your leadership, if, if you like, is public. You're, what you're doing with the team is seen by everybody in the team. There's the private level, which is the level where um, you're in one-to-one -one conversations individuals where you're where you're working with individuals whether it's uh, about um, supporting them helping them or doing whatever it is that they they need it's it's a one-to-one -one interaction so it's private it's not something that anybody else sees but it's also a, it's, it's part of your leadership start and you need to be aware of it and the final part which which uh, Schooler puts a lot of focus on actually is the idea of the personal and the sense that you cannot be a successful leader unless you are also um, thinking about how you can be better. I mean, it's like about self mastery, and it's about uh, self actualization, and 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 becoming a, a, a sort of changing yourself, if you like, in order to change others. <laughs> and he's very strongly um, focused on that that uh, that personal part. Um, I've clicked a couple of times the panel and it's not moving. I'm not quite sure what. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> okay, so uh, to sum up Schooler's idea and, and, and my sort of like development of that idea is the, uh, the idea here is to focus on key leadership behaviours. Skills and knowledge under, underlying the behaviour. How do you learn these things? How do you become a better leader? And there's also a very strong sense of what's the psychology of leaders and how can you become a better leader by developing yourself. It's a strong focus on self-mastery. And to conclude, uh, another quote uh, from Nelson Mandela, who I've mentioned now three times, um, is very much focused on this idea of self-mastery. You can't change others until you change yourself. That's, that's what Mandela said about and negotiating and, and making things happen, and of course he successfully did those things. <coughs> so, uh, any questions? Uh, I feel like I rushed towards the end a little bit, but I hope that is okay. And um, I wonder if there's any questions. Thank you, Andy. I'm I... going to have to relay these questions. Yes, sure. Um, if you have any questions, please do type them in in your chat box, and I can convey them to Andy. Andy, while, um, while the attendees are getting their questions together, I had one to start us off. 
Um, okay. We talked about quiet and effective people being leaders themselves, but we operate very much in a culture where the showy, pushy people get ahead and the rest sort of get ignored for leadership and management positions. Um, what would your advice be to the quiet achievers? Um, hmm. Well, I, I think, yeah, there is, I, I think this, this comes down, there is, a, there is a theory, there is an idea about effective and, um, I'm trying to think of what, what, what the word is, there's, there's effective and successful managers, yeah, there, there, there was this, um, I'm trying to think who wrote it, but there was this idea of successful and effective managers, and successful managers are ones who, um, uh, spend their time basically managing upwards. They're the ones who are, they're not really doing any management. What they're doing is making sure that their bosses see them. And uh, and they, um, they, they progress not by actually being a good manager but by being, um, uh, by doing the right things as they perceive their superiors want to see. And then there's effective managers who actually manage successfully, and they are good managers, and they actually, you know, they work well with their team. And if you like, they're managing downwards. They're managing the people who, who their job is to manage. And um, how we effective managers, I'd like to imagine everybody in this room is an effective manager, not a successful manager, in the sense that I've just described it. <coughs> um, who are managing down, managing their team. Um, how we kind of deal with that fact, I think, is uh, it's an interesting question, and um, I'm not sure there's necessarily an, an easy answer to it, other than uh, hope that your bosses are wise. Yeah. Because if you're, you know, if you have bosses who are taken in by flashy or let's say pushy behaviour, then it's very difficult for you to. To move forward, if you're a quiet and effective manager, when there's someone else there who kind of like you know puts themselves about a bit and actually doesn't do a great job, but in fact kind of seem sort of has a has a sense of self marketing, let's say. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, and in that situation, th there isn't much you can do in order to um, to kind of to overcome that problem, other than just keep getting on with your job and keep doing your job successfully. And somewhere down the line, it will work out for you. But I realise that's that's not that's not a terribly kind of um, positive answer. But actually, that's the only answer. I, I don't see another answer to that question. But I do recognise it's a problem that people have. Um, yep. And yep. You know, if your if your if the boss if your bosses people above you are 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 actually wise and you have respect for them, then it shouldn't be a problem. But if 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 there are people above you who you think don't really know what's going on, then you do have a this problem in some ways, yes. Thank you, Andy. Um we have a couple of questions come in. Do you have any advice to reverse a negative team culture? Um and linked to this is another comment that one of the attendees made. Um for a leader to be successful, team members need to be ready to be led as well. And I think the two are related. Yeah, I think they are. I think um, uh, I think that is that is the case. Um, so to go to the question, um, if there's a negative team culture, I think, uh, well, I, I, in some ways, it, the answer is it depends because it depends on how negative and why is it negative, and what's the what, what's what's the history of the negativity, let's say. Um, and if the history of the negativity is based uh, on something that you've previously done, it's quite difficult to change because because that baggage is there, that, that history is there. Um, but it can be changed, and I, and I, think, um, I think being open and being honest and, um, and working with uh, the team is, is, is the only way you're going to change it. Um, and um, so, so if, if, the, if the negativity within the team is related to kind of conflicts within the team, then uh, you need to work on managing those conflicts and resolving those conflicts and coming up and, and then building bridges and building that team together. That's the affiliative style that, that Goldman talks about. So if negativity is, is, is something that's sort of internal to the team, then that's what that's what you need to do. Um, and if if the negativity relates to um, 
let's say, uh, dissatisfaction with the organization or, um, or dissatisfaction with uh, something that's out of your control, then in a sense that gives you the opportunity because you can um, uh, you can work with that team and, it, and you can build that sense of, build those bonds through that kind of sense of it's us against them in, in a way where you know if, if you've been knocked back for a salary raise and you, the, you know, the, the teachers aren't resenting you so so the, the, the problem here is uh, is maybe if that negative culture comes from previous experience with someone in your position mm -hmm. or previous experience with you now if it's someone in your position then I, you do have an opportunity on, and it, and I'm not saying it's easy but it, it's something you can do where it's essentially those things I suggested, those ideas and making sure you know everyone is, working with the group harmony and working with the group as a whole. Um, and also um, the idea about shared vision. And, and as I say, I do know that the, the word vision tends to be one of those words that kind of puts people's back up straight away. Ah, vision, what's all that? Um, but I, I mean that I, you don't have to call it a vision. <laughs> you can talk it. You can you you can just have a meeting where you come together to talk about well, what is it we do here? What, why do we come to work? Why do we work with this school? Why, you know, why do we do this? And and start to build uh, a sense of uh, a kind of communal goal because yeah. the only way you, you come together as a team is if there's some re reason for you to, to you know if there's some goal that you're, you're that you're working towards yep. that everybody agrees and not that someone that you've just said to them you've got to do this yep so it's something that everyone agrees on well, why do we come to work why do we do these things yep so um, if, if, so if, it, if it's about negative attitude if some negative history with you uh, as you specifically you personally about the way you've managed in the past it is difficult of course but it's not impossible I mean you know we 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 make up for things all the time and you know and if, if there's some problem that's arisen you can you can you, you know you can work through it and and work with the team and um and and get there i'm not yep. saying it's easy but yep. it's it, it's something you can do Thank you, Andy. Um, there's a lot of interesting questions coming through now, so please bear with me as I work through them. Um, one of the comments connected to the vision was um, undoing damage and mistrust by previous managers does take a long time, um, um, and eventually you work through that, as you said. Um, and one of the other questions has to do with the shared vision. Um, if the team does not share the vision, that is the vision of the organization, what do you do in that kind of situation or do you have any advice? Um, I'll just repeat that, Andy. If the, developing a shared vision where the vision, where the vision, uh, sorry, where the vision by the team is necessarily not the vision of the organization. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think, if the vision of the organization doesn't speak to the team and that obviously that happens um, you know and, and often you know this this thing comes I mean a lot of I know a lot of the people who are who are here probably work for these large chains like study group or Navitas or so on who you know has, and, and you know the vision has come from somewhere that's made there's nowhere it's not related to where you are working on the ground if you if you like and and it may well be that the teachers there feel like well you know where does this come from who you know, what's this vision um, and it doesn't speak to them and and I completely understand that the idea of the shared vision thing is not about what the organisational vision is if you like it's not about a, a a statement on the website it's about something that you excuse me you as a team are are working towards yeah um, and you can develop a shared vision. In your own team, so you know if you're the if you if you if you manage a team of 15 teachers, you can work with that team of 15 teachers. There may be an organisational vision, there may be a, a vision that's been given to you, a top-down vision, if you like. That's fine, but you, that's not what this is about. This is about what is it that we we the team of 15 um, want to create for ourselves. What 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 do we want? And and then after you've kind of come up with this vision, well, you know, what do we want? What how do we want to be? Uh, do we want to get lots of training? Do we want to be developed and so on? Then you can start working with how does that fit into the vision of the organisation? So I want so so a shared vision has to be a shared vision, and the only way it really can be a shared vision is if it the people there made it. Yep. Um, if if you tell people this is the vision, you know, even if it's a great vision, if it's well phrased, perfect, and, and it's in their interests, 
there's still people who are still saying, well, you, know, you just told us what the vision is. It's not my vision. It's yours. Yep. So I think it has to be it has to be developed together. Thank you, Andy. We have a question about quadrant three, um, and the question is: any advice on dealing with the pushback uh, and resentment you'll generate by saying no to people with urgent but not important issues? Because clearly, it's urgent to them, not important in the larger scheme of things for you. Um, how would you deal with that? Um, I think. Well, I, I mean, I think it, it's all. In some ways, it's a, it's a cultural change, um, and, and that maybe is. A, I've overstated that slightly with the word cultural. Um, it, the way that you work, and the way that people in your team work, I think uh, there are many things that you can do, which which, which sort of. Um, which will help to to make these things um, easier, if you like. So, uh, at the beginning, um, you know, if you suddenly change, and you know, if you if you've always been kind of one of these people, one of these managers who's always said, yes, yes, come in, and you know, I've opened a policy, come in anytime, any problems, just come in and, and talk to me. And we're talking face to face interactions here. I think you can, you know, with emails, you can just not open the email until the time that you, you've got time to open the email. But if it, I mean, if it's face-to-face -face interaction, people coming in your office and saying, "I've got this problem," um, then, then you, then you, you kind of need to make a sort of a slight cultural shift. And some of the ways that you can do that, um, I don't have time to go into the idea of monkey management now. I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard this idea of monkey management. It's about you know, sort of, kind of making sure that people think about their own problems before they bring them to you. Because mm. um, it may well be that it's not something you need to take care of, someone, someone else can do it. Um, and uh, the more and more that people feel that you trust them to, to take care of things and you, and you, and you, and you know they'll do it well, um, is, will, will, will help that fact. Now, the, the problem is that sometimes people will come to you with a problem that they think is urgent and important and in fact is just urgent and is not important. Yep. And obviously if it is, if it does turn out to be urgent and important, then it has to be taken care of and has been taken care of then and it's a quadrant one. So it's, it's something that has to be done, whether it's you or whether it's the person who does it, but someone has to do it. <clears throat> but if, if, if they come to you with something that you know they regard as urgent and you say, uh, I think you just say, you know, uh, okay, can we park that? Can we, can we, can we hold that off for a moment? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm working on something, and, um, uh, um, you know, when, when do we have some free time to take care of this, this fact? I mean, it is something that probably will have to be done, but it doesn't necessarily have to be done then. So I think, you know, sort of just being honest with people and saying, you know, um, let's, let's come back to that. Uh, I mean, just like you do when you're teaching. I mean, you know, if a student comes up with a question in the middle of something which is kind of irrelevant and kind of out of the out of the loop or something like this, you you don't you don't kind of slap the student down and say no, that's an irrelevant question. You say okay, well, let's let's come back to that question. I mean, I think that's the way you handle it. It's the same way that you do in the classroom. Yep. Thank you, Andy. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. There's a couple more questions, but I'll email them to Andy and. I'll get back to you with the responses. Um, Andy, thank you so much for taking the time um, to talk to us today. And this was a really informative and inspiring session for me, and I hope the rest of you felt the same. Um, Andy will be presenting at our conference this year in Hobart. So please come to the conference to see Andy there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andy, thank you once again. Um, oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank and you, thanks, Aparna, for organizing everything and arranging everything. Thanks. Um, so, guys, the the, we, the webinar recording and the slides will be available on the English Australia website, and I will be sending you an email about this. Thank you, and talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.